Left-wing market anarchism, a form of left libertarianism, individualist anarchism and libertarian socialism, is associated with contemporary scholars such as Kevin Carson, Roderick T. Long, Charles Johnson, Brad Spangler, Sheldon Richman, Chris Matthew Shabara and Gary Chartier, who stress the value of radically free markets, termed freed markets to distinguish them from the common conception which these libertarians believe to be riddled with statist and capitalist privileges. Referred to as left-wing market anarchists or market-oriented left libertarians, proponents of this approach strongly affirm the classical liberal ideas of self-ownership and free markets, while maintaining that taken to their logical conclusions these ideas support anti-capitalist, anti-corporatist, anti-hierarchical, pro-labor positions in economics, anti-imperialism in foreign policy, and thoroughly radical views regarding such cultural issues as gender, sexuality and race. The genealogy of contemporary market-oriented left libertarianism, sometimes labeled left-wing market anarchism, overlaps to a significant degree with that of Steiner Valentine left libertarianism as the roots of that tradition are sketched in the book The Origins of Left Libertarianism. Carson Long-style left libertarianism is rooted in 19th-century mutualism and in the work of figures such as Thomas Hodgkin and the individualist anarchists Benjamin Tucker and Lysander Spooner. While with notable exceptions, market-oriented libertarians after Tucker tended to ally with the political right, relationships between such libertarians and the new left thrived in the 1960s, laying the groundwork for modern left-wing market anarchism. Left-wing market anarchism identifies with left libertarianism or left-wing libertarianism which names several related but distinct approaches to politics, society, culture and political and social theory, which stress both individual freedom and social justice. Unlike right libertarians, they believe that neither claiming nor mixing one's labor with natural resources is enough to generate full private property rights and maintain that natural resources land, oil, gold, trees ought to be held in some egalitarian manner, either unowned or owned collectively. Those left libertarians who support private property do so under the condition that recompense is offered to the local community. Topic. Precedents. 19th and early 20th century, mutualism, individualist anarchism and Georgism Josiah Warren is widely regarded as the first American anarchist and the four-page weekly paper he edited during 1833, The Peaceful Revolutionist, was the first anarchist periodical published, an enterprise for which he built his own printing press, cast his own type and made his own printing plates. Warren was a follower of Robert Owen and joined Owen's community at New Harmony, Indiana. Josiah Warren termed the phrase, cost the limit of price, with cost, here referring not to monetary price paid but the labor one exerted to produce an item. Therefore, he proposed a system to pay people with certificates indicating how many hours of work they did. They could exchange the notes at local time stores for goods that took the same amount of time to produce. He put his theories to the test by establishing an experimental labor for labor store called the Cincinnati Time Store where trade was facilitated by notes backed by a promise to perform labor. The store proved successful and operated for three years after which it was closed so that Warren could pursue establishing colonies based on mutualism. These included utopia and modern times. Warren said that Stephen Pearl Andrews' The Science of Society, published in 1852, was the most lucid and complete exposition of Warren's own theories. Catalan historian Xavier Diaz report that the intentional communal experiments pioneered by Warren were influential in European individualist anarchists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries such as Emile Armand and the intentional communities started by them. Mutualism began in 18th century English and French labor movements before taking an anarchist form associated with Pierre Joseph Proudhon in France and others in the United States. Proudhon proposed spontaneous order, whereby organization emerges without central authority, a positive anarchy, where order arises when everybody does what he wishes and only what he wishes, and where business transactions alone produce the social order. It is important to recognize that Proudhon distinguished between ideal political possibilities and practical governance. 
For this reason, much in contrast to some of his theoretical statements concerning ultimate spontaneous self-governance, Proudhon was heavily involved in French parliamentary politics and allied himself not with anarchist but socialist factions of workers' movements and in addition to advocating state-protected charters for worker-owned cooperatives, promoted certain nationalization schemes during his life of public service. Mutualist anarchism is concerned with reciprocity, free association, voluntary contract, federation and credit and currency reform. According to the American mutualist William Batchelder Green, each worker in the mutualist system would receive just an exact pay for his work, services equivalent in cost being exchangeable for services equivalent in cost, without profit or discount. Mutualism has been retrospectively characterized as ideologically situated between individualist and collectivist forms of anarchism. Proudhon first characterized his goal as a third form of society, the synthesis of communism and property. Pierre Joseph Proudhon was a French activist and theorist, the founder of mutualist philosophy, an economist, and a libertarian socialist. He was the first person to declare himself an anarchist and is among its most influential theorists. He is considered by many to be the father of anarchism. He became a member of the French Parliament after the Revolution of 1848, whereupon and thereafter he referred to himself as a federalist. Proudhon, who was born in Boussançon, was a printer who taught himself Latin in order to better print books in the language. His best-known assertion is that property is theft, contained in his first major work, What is Property? Or, An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and Government Recherche sur le principe du droit et du gouvernement, published in 1840. The book's publication attracted the attention of the French authorities. It also attracted the scrutiny of Karl Marx, who started a correspondence with its author. The two influenced each other, they met in Paris while Marx was exiled there. Their friendship finally ended when Marx responded to Proudhon's The System of Economic Contradictions, or The Philosophy of Poverty with the provocatively titled The Poverty of Philosophy. The dispute became one of the sources of the split between the anarchist and Marxian wings of the International Working Men's Association. Some, such as Edmund Wilson, have contended that Marx's attack on Proudhon had its origin in the latter's defense of Karl Grun, whom Marx bitterly disliked but who had been preparing translations of Proudhon's work. Proudhon favored workers' associations or co-operatives as well as individual worker, peasant possession over private ownership or the nationalization of land and workplaces. He considered social revolution to be achievable in a peaceful manner. In the Confessions of a Revolutionary Proudhon asserted that, anarchy is order without power, the phrase which much later inspired, in the view of some, the anarchist circle a symbol, today, one of the most common graffiti on the urban landscape. He unsuccessfully tried to create a national bank to be funded by what became an abortive attempt at an income tax on capitalists and shareholders. Similar in some respects to a credit union, it would have given interest-free loans. William Batchelder Green (1819–1878) was a 19th-century mutualist, individualist, anarchist, Unitarian minister, soldier, and promoter of free banking in the United States. Green is best known for the works *Mutual Banking* (1850), which proposed an interest-free banking system, and *Transcendentalism*, a critique of the New England philosophical school. For American anarchist historian Eunice Manette Schuster, it is apparent less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 that Proudhonian anarchism was to be found in the United States at least as early as 1848, and that it was not conscious of its affinity to the individualist anarchism of Josiah Warren and Stephen Pearl Andrews. William B. Green presented this Proudhonian mutualism in its purest and most systematic form. After 1850 he became active in labor reform. He was elected vice president of the New England Labor Reform League, the majority of the members holding to Proudhon's scheme of mutual banking, and in 1869 president of the Massachusetts Labor Union. He then publishes Socialistic, Mutualistic, and Financial Fragments 1875. He saw mutualism as the synthesis of liberty and order. His associationism less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 is checked by individualism. Mind your own business. Judge not that ye be not judged. Quote dot. 
over matters which are purely personal, as for example moral conduct, the individual is sovereign, as well as over that which he himself produces. For this reason he demands mutuality in marriage, the equal right of a woman to her own personal freedom and property. A form of individualist anarchism was found in the United States, as advocated by the Boston anarchists. Some Boston anarchists including Benjamin Tucker, identified themselves as socialists, which in the 19th century was often used in the sense of a commitment to improving conditions of the working class i.e., the labor problem. The Boston anarchists, such as Tucker and his followers are also considered socialists due to their opposition to usury. By around the start of the 20th century, the heyday of individualist anarchism had passed. On the other hand, anarchist historian George Woodcock describes Lysander Spooner's essays as an eloquent elaboration of Josiah Warren and the early American development of Proudhon's ideas, and associates his works with that of Stephen Pearl Andrews. Woodcock also reports that both Lysander Spooner and William B. Green had been members of the socialist first international American individualist anarchist Benjamin Tucker identified as a socialist and argued that the elimination of what he called the four monopolies, the land monopoly, the money and banking monopoly, the monopoly powers conferred by patents and the quasi-monopolistic effects of tariffs, would undermine the power of the wealthy and big business, making possible widespread property ownership and higher incomes for ordinary people, while minimizing the power of would-be bosses and achieving socialist goals without state action. Tucker influenced and interacted with anarchist contemporaries, including Spooner, Voltairine de Clare, Dyer D. Lum, and William B. Green, who have in various ways influenced later left libertarian thinking. Kevin Carson characterizes American individualist anarchism by saying, Unlike the rest of the socialist movement, the individualist anarchists believed that the natural wage of labor in a free market was its product and that economic exploitation could only take place when capitalists and landlords harnessed the power of the state in their interests. Thus individualist anarchism was an alternative both to the increasing statism of the mainstream socialist movement, and to a classical liberal movement that was moving toward a mere apologetic for the power of big business. Two individualist anarchists who wrote in Benjamin Tucker's Liberty were also important labor organizers of the time. Joseph Labadee and Dyer Lum. Kevin Carson has praised Dyer Lum's fusion of individualist laissez-faire economics with radical labor activism as creative and described him as more significant than any in the Boston group. Some of the American individualist anarchists later in this era such as Benjamin Tucker abandoned natural rights positions and converted to Max Stirner's egoist anarchism. Rejecting the idea of moral rights, Tucker said that there were only two rights, the right of might, and the right of contract. He also said after converting to egoist individualism, in times past, it was my habit to talk glibly of the right of man to land. It was a bad habit, and I long ago sloughed it off. Man's only right to land is his might over it. In adopting Stern Right Egoism, 1886, Tucker rejected natural rights, which had long been considered the foundation of libertarianism. This rejection galvanized the movement into fierce debates, with the natural rights proponents accusing the egoists of destroying libertarianism itself. So bitter was the conflict that a number of natural rights proponents withdrew from the pages of liberty in protest even though they had hitherto been among its frequent contributors. Thereafter, liberty championed egoism although its general content did not change significantly. Geolibertarianism, an anarchist form of Henry George's philosophy, is considered left libertarian because it assumes land to be initially owned in common, so that when land is privately appropriated the proprietor pays rent to the community. Geolibertarians generally advocate distributing the land rent to the community via a land value tax as proposed by Henry George and others before him. For this reason, they are often called single taxers. Fred E. Foldvery coined the word geolibertarianism in an article so titled In Land and Liberty. In the case of geoanarchism, the voluntary form of geolibertarianism is described by Foldvery. Rent would be collected by private associations with the opportunity to secede from the rent sharing community and not receive the community's services. Similar economic positions also existed within European individualist anarchism. 
French individualist anarchist Emile Armand shows clearly opposition to capitalism and centralized economies when he said that the individualist anarchist, "...inwardly he remains refractory, fatally refractory, morally, intellectually, economically the capitalist economy and the directed economy, the speculators and the fabricators of single are equally repugnant to him." He argued for a pluralistic economic logic when he said, here and there everything happening, here everyone receiving what they need, there each one getting whatever is needed according to their own capacity. Here, gift and barter, one product for another, there, exchange, product for representative value. Here, the producer is the owner of the product, there, the product is put to the possession of the collectivity. Quote dot. The Spanish individualist anarchist Miguel Jiménez Igualada thought that Capitalism is an effect of government, the disappearance of government means capitalism falls from its pedestal vertiginously that which we call capitalism is not something else but a product of the state, within which the only thing that is being pushed forward is profit, good or badly acquired. And so to fight against capitalism is a pointless task, since be it state capitalism or enterprise capitalism, as long as government exists, exploiting capital will exist. The fight, but of consciousness, is against the state." His view on class division and technocracy are as follows. Since when no one works for another, the profiteer from wealth disappears, just as government will disappear when no one pays attention to those who learned four things at universities and from that fact they pretend to govern men. Big industrial enterprises will be transformed by men in big associations in which everyone will work and enjoy the product of their work. And from those easy as well as beautiful problems anarchism deals with and he who puts them in practice and lives them are anarchists. The priority which without rest an anarchist must make is that in which no one has to exploit anyone, no man to no man, since that non-exploitation will lead to the limitation of property to individual needs. The 1960s, American Libertarianism and the New Left The doyen of modern American market-oriented libertarianism, Austrian school economist Murray Rothbard, was initially an enthusiastic partisan of the Old Right, particularly because of its general opposition to war and imperialism. However, Rothbard had long embraced a reading of American history that emphasized the role of elite privilege in shaping legal and political institutions, one that was thus naturally agreeable to many on the left, and he came increasingly in the 1960s to seek alliances on the left, especially with members of the New Left. In light of the Vietnam War, the military draft and the emergence of the Black Power movement, working with other radicals like Ronald Radosh and Carl Hess, Rothbard argued that the consensus view of American economic history, according to which a beneficent government has used its power to counter corporate predation, is fundamentally flawed. Rather, he argued, government intervention in the economy has largely benefited established players at the expense of marginalized groups to the detriment of both liberty and equality. Moreover, the robber baron period, hailed by the right and despised by the left as a heyday of laissez-faire, was not characterized by laissez-faire at all but was in fact a time of massive state privilege accorded to capital. In tandem with his emphasis on the intimate connection between state and corporate power, he defended the seizure of corporations dependent on state largesse by workers and others. Rothbard himself ultimately broke with the left, allying himself instead with the burgeoning paleo conservative movement. However, drawing on the work of Rothbard during his alliance with the left and on the thought of Carl Hess, some thinkers associated with market-oriented American libertarianism came increasingly to identify with the left on a range of issues, including opposition to war, corporate oligopolies and state corporate partnerships and an affinity for cultural liberalism. One variety of this kind of libertarianism has been a resurgent mutualism, incorporating modern economic ideas such as marginal utility theory into mutualist theory. Kevin A. Carson's studies in mutualist political economy helped to stimulate the growth of new style mutualism, articulating a version of the labor theory of value incorporating ideas drawn from Austrian economics. Other market-oriented left libertarians have declined to embrace mutualist views of real property, while sharing the mutualist opposition to corporate hierarchies and wealth concentration. 
Left libertarians have placed particular emphasis on the articulation and defense of a libertarian theory of class and class conflict, though considerable work in this area has been performed by libertarians of other persuasions. Theory Arguing that vast disparities in wealth and social influence result from the use of force and especially state power to steal and engross land and acquire and maintain special privileges, members of this thought typically urge the abolition of the state. They judge that in a stateless society, the kinds of privileges secured by the state will be absent and injustices perpetrated or tolerated by the state can be rectified. According to libertarian scholar Sheldon Richman, left libertarians favor worker solidarity vis-a-vis -vis bosses, support poor people squatting on government or abandoned property, and prefer that corporate privileges be repealed before the regulatory restrictions on how those privileges may be exercised. They see Walmart as a symbol of corporate favoritism, supported by highway subsidies and eminent domain, view the fictive personhood of the limited liability corporation with suspicion, and doubt that third world sweatshops would be the best alternative in the absence of government manipulation. Left libertarians tend to eschew electoral politics, having little confidence in strategies that work through the government. They prefer to develop alternative institutions and methods of working around the state. Gary Chartier has joined Kevin Carson, Charles Johnson and others echoing the language of Benjamin Tucker and Thomas Hodgkin in maintaining that because of its heritage and its emancipatory goals and potential, radical market anarchism should be seen, by its proponents and by others, as part of the socialist tradition and that market anarchists can and should call themselves socialists. Topic. Labor rights Also there is a tendency to support labor struggles. Kevin Carson has praised individualist anarchist Dyer Lum's fusion of individualist economics with radical labor activism as creative and described him as more significant than any in the Boston group. Roderick T. Long is an advocate of build -ing worker solidarity. On the one hand, this means formal organization, including unionization, but I'm not talking about the prevailing model of business unions, but real unions, the old-fashioned kind, committed to the working class and not just union members, and interested in worker autonomy, not government patronage." Long in particular has described the situation Topic. Cultural politics. Contemporary free market left libertarians also show markedly more sympathy than mainstream or paleolibertarians towards various cultural movements which challenge non-governmental relations of power. For instance, left libertarians Roderick Long and Charles Johnson have called for a recovery of the 19th-century alliance with radical liberalism and feminism. While adopting familiar libertarian views including opposition to drug prohibition, gun control, civil liberties violations and war, left libertarians are more likely than most self-identified libertarians to take more distinctively leftist stances on issues as diverse as feminism, gender and sexuality, class, immigration and environmentalism. Especially influential regarding these topics have been scholars including Chris Matthew Shabara, Roderick T. Long, Charles W. Johnson and Arthur Silber. Topic. Property rights Left market anarchism does not have any strict agreement what constitutes legitimate property titles. Arguments have been made for Rothbardian, Georgist, mutualist and utilitarian approaches to determining legitimate property claims. Such discrepancies are resolved through deliberation mechanisms like polycentric law. Left market anarchism also recognizes the importance of property held and managed in common as a way of maintaining common goods. Topic. Theorists Kevin Carson describes his politics as on the outer fringes of both free market libertarianism and socialism. He has identified the work of Benjamin Tucker, Thomas Hodgskin, Ralph Bersotti, Paul Goodman, Louis Mumford, Eleanor Ostrom, Peter Kropotkin and Ivan Illich as sources of inspiration for his approach to politics and economics. In addition to individualist anarchist Benjamin Tucker's Big Four, 
monopolies land, money, tariffs and patents, Carson argues that the state has also transferred wealth to the wealthy by subsidizing organizational centralization in the form of transportation and communication subsidies. He believes that Tucker overlooked this issue due to Tucker's focus on individual market transactions, whereas Carson also focuses on organizational issues. The theoretical sections of studies in mutualist political economy are presented as an attempt to integrate marginalist critiques into the labor theory of value. Carson has also been highly critical of intellectual property. The primary focus of his most recent work has been decentralized manufacturing and the informal and household economies. In response to claims that he uses the term capitalism incorrectly, Carson says he is deliberately choosing to resurrect what he claims to be an old definition of the term in order to make a point. He claims that the term capitalism, as it was originally used, did not refer to a free market, but to a type of statist class system in which capitalists controlled the state and the state intervened in the market on their behalf. Carson holds that capitalism, arising as a new class society directly from the old class society of the Middle Ages, was founded on an act of robbery as massive as the earlier feudal conquest of the land. It has been sustained to the present by continual state intervention to protect its system of privilege without which its survival is unimaginable. Carson argues that in a truly laissez-faire system, the ability to extract a profit from labor and capital would be negligible. Carson coined the pejorative term vulgar libertarianism, a phrase that describes the use of a free market rhetoric in defense of corporate capitalism and economic inequality. According to Carson, the term is derived from the phrase, vulgar political economy, which Karl Marx described as an economic order that deliberately becomes increasingly apologetic and makes strenuous attempts to talk out of existence the ideas which contain the contradictions existing in economic life. Gary Chartier offers an understanding of property rights as contingent but tightly constrained social strategies, reflective of the importance of multiple, overlapping rationales for separate ownership and of natural law principles of practical reasonableness, defending robust but non-absolute protections for these rights in a manner similar to that employed by David Hume. This account is distinguished both from Lockean and Neo-Lockean views which deduce property rights from the idea of self-ownership and from consequentialist accounts that might license widespread ad hoc interference with the possessions of groups and individuals. Chartier uses this account to ground a clear statement of the natural law basis for the view that solidaristic wealth redistribution by individual persons is often morally required, but as a response by individuals and grassroots networks to particular circumstances rather than as a state-driven attempt to achieve a particular distributive pattern. He advances detailed arguments for workplace democracy rooted in such natural law principles as subsidiarity, defending it as morally desirable and as a likely outcome of the elimination of injustice rather than as something to be mandated by the state. He discusses natural law approaches to land reform and to the occupation of factories by workers. Chartier objects on natural law grounds to intellectual property protections, drawing on his theory of property rights more generally and develops a general natural law account of boycotts. He has argued that proponents of genuinely freed markets should explicitly reject capitalism and identify with the global anti-capitalist movement, while emphasizing that the abuses the anti-capitalist movement highlights result from state-tolerated violence and state-secured privilege rather than from voluntary cooperation and exchange. According to Chartier, it makes sense for left libertarians to name what they oppose capitalism, doing so ensures that advocates of freedom aren't confused with people who use market rhetoric to prop up an unjust status quo, and expresses solidarity between defenders of freed markets and workers, as well as ordinary people around the world who use capitalism as a shorthand label for the world system that constrains their freedom and stunts their lives. See also Topic References Topic Further reading Kevin A. Carson, The Iron Fist Behind the Invisible Hand, Corporate Capitalism as a State Guaranteed System of Privilege, Nanaimo, BC, Red Lion 2001. Kevin A. Carson, Austrian and Marxist Theories of Monopoly Capital London, Libertarian Alliance 2004 
Kevin A. Carson, Contract Feudalism, A Critique of Employer Power Over Employees London, Libertarian Alliance 2006 Kevin A. Carson, The Ethics of Labor Struggle, A Free Market Perspective N. P. Alliance of the Libertarian Left 2008 Chartier, Gary. The Conscience of an Anarchist 2011 Apple Valley, C.A., Cobden Press. ISBN 978-1439266991. OCLC 760,097,242. Chartier, Gary. Economic Justice and Natural Law, 2009. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. ISBN 9780521767200. OCLC 318,871,444. Chartier, Gary, Johnson, Charles W. 2011. Markets Not Capitalism, Individualist Anarchism Against Bosses, Inequality, Corporate Power, and Structural Poverty. Brooklyn, N.Y., Minor Compositions, Autonomedia Chartier, Gary. Anarchy and Legal Order, Law and Politics for a Stateless Society, 2013 New York, Cambridge University Press. ISBN 978-1107032286. OCLC 795645156 External links Alliance of the Libertarian Left Mutualist. Org, Free Market Anti-Capitalism Center for a Stateless Society